This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 30, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 through chapter 5, verse 21. Demonstration of Christian Love Hi, my name is Herb Bateman. Um, I'd like to conclude our study in 1 John uh, by looking at the demonstration of Christian love as it closes out uh, the book of 1 John. Um, uh, the demonstration of Christian love goes from 420 to 517, and then uh, John has uh, an epilogue, uh, a summary uh, of the epistle. So we're going to be looking at um, the remainder of uh, 1 John, first by talking about the uh, demonstration of Christian love, what Christian love looks like, and just some summary statements, some concluding remarks that um, John makes. So let's go ahead and begin by looking at the essence of love that we see uh, in 1 John 4, 20 uh, through 5, 3. And uh, here we have, if anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his fellow Christian, he is a liar. Because the one who does not love his fellow Christian, whom he has seen, uh, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And the commandments we have from him is this, that the one who loves God should love his fellow Christian too. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is fathered by God. And everyone who loves the Father loves the children or the child fathered by him. By this we know that we love the children of God, whenever we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. His commandments do not weigh us down. So uh, he begins here by uh, making a claim uh, to, uh, to love God. Um, uh, if, if anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother, he is a liar. And we've seen this uh, um, mentioned several times, this idea of a liar uh, throughout um, um, John. Uh, the one who says he, he has no sin makes God out to be a liar. Um, so we see this, this term for liar uh, appearing throughout um, uh, the gospel, uh, throughout this letter. Um, he's concerned about fellow Christians who say they love God and hates their brother. And his line of argument is pretty straightforward because he says the one who loves God should love his fellow Christian too. Every, um, I'm sorry. Um, the one who does not love his fellow Christian whom he has seen cannot love God he has not seen. If we can't love the people that are around us who are image bearers that have been redeemed uh, because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, if we cannot love the people of God, the children of God, um, the people who make professions of faith, if we can't love them that we run in contact with and see, how can we claim to love God who we don't see? Um, the line of argumentation um, is extremely helpful. And, and we can carry that a step further is in that if... We can't love one another and demonstrate that there is an eternal God who does love us. If we can't love one another whom we can't, uh, we can't love that we see, what type of testimony do we have as people are looking in on us? Um, 
from outside the church. They're looking to see God. To see God means that we demonstrate and live a life of love. But if we are backbiting, if we are um, more apt to want to create perceptions in order to gain control of, uh, of leadership positions in the church, to gain control within, uh, uh, within an uh, academic institution, to gain control within uh, a denomination, uh, if, we, if we maneuver, position ourselves, and act in manner in ways that, is, that are unloving towards those that we see and we know are brothers and sisters in Christ, what does that say about, um, about our testimony? They're looking to see God. They don't see God when we act in, in those manners. But they can see God if we love one another as God loves us and manifests that love. And the one who, uh, and the one, and the commandment we have from him is that we love the one who loves God and should love his fellow Christians. He is fathered by God. Now, this idea of being fathered by God, um, we've seen this before, and I, I thought maybe I'd, I'd pause and talk about um, a, um, a word as it appears in uh, earlier um, in uh, 1 John. It, um, it appears in verse 9 of chapter 3, where um, we are described as being the, a seed. Um, 3 9 says, Everyone who is fathered by God does not practice sin because God's seed resides um, in him and thus he is not able to sin. So everyone who fathered by God does not practice sin because God's sin, I mean seed, resides in him. Um, th this is talking and actually taking, uh, the, the term for seed is a, is a metaphor, metaphorical term, and um, it really is a little bit unclear uh, what the spirituality that the author intends by this figure. But I thought I'd draw some parallels because this idea of being fathered by God keeps coming up and us being, uh, and his seed being within, within us is going back to this verse 9 in chapter 3. Some commentators will draw parallels between the seed and the word in Matthew um, 13 where uh, um, person is throwing seed out into, into the field. Others argue that it refers to the Holy Spirit, especially in the context of a covenant interpretation uh, in, uh, of First John. Um, the identification of God's seed with the Holy Spirit becomes possible. Divine remaining is also associated with the Spirit. Um, still others argue that seed is used of believers who share in God's nature or character traits. Um, anyone who is born of God, says one commentator, Streaker, um, is of, the, of one nature with God, lives in irreconcilably opposition to every kind of sinful behavior. As I look at this, and once again, you know, as I have uh, studied this um, uh, for a while, but, uh, but always open to growing in my understanding here, it seems that, that this idea of a seed within us is a combination of, of all three. Um, that the author is emphasizing God's word, um, which is his commandments, that we love him and love others. Um, it, it does speak of the anointing. We see this in uh, the fact that um, uh, Jesus has anointed us with his spirit in 2.20 and again uh, mentioned again in 27. And then, um, and then the expectation to exhibit God's character trait of love is seen in chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Uh, we see it in chapter 3.17. And so it seems like uh, this idea of... Um, God's seed being with us, within us, uh, involves um, his commandments, his words that are, that are um, part of who we are inside, his anointing the spirit, which keeps that, 
the, his word alive and refreshes us, and also is the expectation that we're supposed to exhibit God-like character of love. Uh, and so um, one who is fathered by God is going to have these commandments as part of him. The one who is fathered by God is um, going to have the anointing of the Spirit of God. And the one who is fathered by God uh, is expected to exhibit these, characters, these characteristics of love. So everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is fathered by God, has the seed within him, and everyone who loves the Father loves the child, fathered by him. Verse 2 tells us, by this we know that we love the children of God. Whenever we love God and obey his command. So by the very fact that we, we take steps to love one another um, uh, um, is an indication that we belong to God. Um, are we going to at times fail? Yes. Do we at times struggle on how to live with, with others? Yes. Um, but the fact of the matter is we should be taking steps and trying to figure out how can I live at peace with my brothers and my sisters? How can I, how, what, what can I do to live at peace with someone that um, um, is difficult to get along with? I mean, and I, I keep focus on those that we, we have trouble with because of the people we like, we don't have problems loving. <laughs> So let's, let's just deal with this white elephant out there. We're talking about the people that rub us the wrong way, right? Ladies and gentlemen, it's hard to be a Christian. It's hard to live the Christian life. And sometimes we're going to succeed, and sometimes we're not. But we are. We are to make it a pattern of behavior to try to live a successful uh, Christian life and loving those we come in contact with, whether we like them or not. For this is love. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Um, I want to... Um, I want to... Um, I want to talk about this idea of uh, how this commandment doesn't weigh us down. Um, we, we read, um, um, you know, what, what does that mean? Um, once again, um, it's, it's, a, it's a metaphor uh, to describe um, regulations and um, legal matters as the Pharisees, uh, you know, matters of the, of the Pharisees. It's, um, you know, it's at times it's used in the New Testament to speak of the regulations, rules, and the legal matters that uh, of the Pharisees. They, they, they look at these Pharisaical laws as being heavy burdens. Um, uh, the expectations of this religious group uh, were crushing. Um, they were unbearable in, in much the same way as a tax collector's expectations were oppressive. Other times the term is used to describe um, arrogant rulers and their cruel manner of leadership. Um, for instance, uh, people of uh, Gadara complained that Herod's in, in, injunctions were so heavy um, they couldn't bear it. In other words, they were too severe in much the same way as Pharaoh published ordinances that made demands beyond the abilities of the Jews. Hey, I want you to make bricks, uh, but by the way, I, I'm not going to give you any straw. Heavy burdens, um, unbearable rules and regulations, um, un unreasonable uh, expectations um, by leaders. Uh, that um, are burdensome and, and um, uh, um, unnecessary. Uh, John uses uh, uh, this word uh, metaphorically to describe God's commandments. To love is something that is not burdensome. 
In a similar way, Philo contends, God asks nothing from you that is heavy, complicated, or difficult, but only, some, but only something quite simple and easy. Thus, God's expectation to love other believers is something we are capable of doing. In other words, the author is telling us that God expects to love others is not so much, not too much to ask of us. And once again, I, I don't want... Sometimes I think we, we make this more difficult than it needs to be. Um, loving people that, that we like is easy. Um, the challenge is, how do I love people that, um, that I don't get along with? And once again, there are a number of ways that you, you can do this. Um, it could be that the individual has a... a, 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 a has a, a surgery, and there are opportunities to provide meals for them. Well, via a, uh, an intermediary, you can provide meal and do a loving thing on their behalf, but you don't have to take it to them, but it's an act of love. Um, for whatever reason, that uh, when you get together, uh, you have difficulties um, um, getting along, there are, are there ways that you can demonstrate love where you don't have to necessarily be in their context? Um, um, sometimes they're the loving things to do, um, but we need to think through how we can live. I don't think God's asking us to do something that, that is beyond our ability. We just got to think outside the box a little bit, and that's what he expects. I don't think this expectation to love people that hate you or that you may not necessarily like is, um, is all that difficult to do. I think we can do it. I believe we can do it, and I have done it. The next thing he does is he moves in verse, uh, moves to chapter, uh, in this chapter in verse 4, uh, to talk about um, the testimony uh, about the Son. Um, and in this testimony about the Son, uh, it, it talks about the power to love. Um, and so uh, this is what he says. Um, this is the conquering power that has conquered the world, our faith. Um, uh, now, who um, is the person who has conquered the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, once again, I, I'm going to emphasize that the idea Son of God even though we think about it in systematic theology terms as being a reference to his deity, what has John been constantly hammering at throughout this whole letter? He's been hammering at the fact that a group of people are denying that Jesus is, came in the flesh and that Jesus is the Christ. He hasn't been talking about Jesus' deity. He's been talking about Jesus' messiahship. The fact that he is Messiah. Son of God is a reference to uh, 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 kingship. Uh, uh, the reference to, um, uh, of God saying to Jesus at his baptism, This is my son with whom I am well pleased. A drawing from Psalm 2.7. So I think this idea of son of God in John, even though he's, John is known for his gospel, where you know right from the get-go that Jesus is divine. Um, 1 John is dealing with a whole different set of issues. And he's dealing with a set of issues about a group of people that are denying the humanity of Jesus and his Christology, his, his Messiahship. So here he says that uh, now who is the person who has conquered the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Messiah, um, the Son of God. Jesus, who is the Christ, is the one who came by water and blood, not by water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies. Why? Because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water, and the blood, and these three are in agreement. Now, these verses are loaded, okay? 
And um, I will uh, humbly uh, list some options and, um, and perhaps even give you an opinion. Uh, but this is something that you'll have to work out on your own eventually. Um, all of this information and the, my discussions um, can be found in a, a workbook for Intermediate Greek, uh, which is a grammar, exegesis, and commentary in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Um, it asks, it, uh, it's meant and designed to help a person walk their way through and translate the Johannine letters, beginning with 3rd John, 2nd John, and then going to 1st John. Um, there, the Greek text is in there, an opportunity for you to translate some questions to guide you in your working through the Greek text so you can understand the author's flow of thought. And interspersed throughout this whole thing are uh, commentary on the, on the book, interacting with several commentators. And so uh, uh, what I'm about to share here is a discussion um, concerning this, this phrase, um, by water and blood. What does it mean? through water and blood. Um, it presents uh, numerous interpretive uh, discussions, and I've listed four in this book that are possible rent, uh, understandings. Coming through water and blood might reference to uh, the sacraments or uh, the ordinances of baptism and the Eucharist. And this, is, uh, this view is as old as the fourth century. Uh, Augustus uh, held this view and presented it. Now, the, uh, the polemic of 1 John 5, 6 and its obscurity within the text of 1 John seems to argue against the view uh, for two reasons. Um, first, water and blood appear to be references to events in Jesus' life. And two, there's nothing in the context that suggests that this is the, uh, the opponents were denying the ordinances. What they denied was his humanity and the fact he was Messiah. Which brings us to the second option. The incarnation of, Ju of, uh, incarnation of Jesus. Now this fits because it's about his humanity, right? Um, this view has more to commend for itself because of parallel the authentic confession in 1 John 4, 2 that Jesus, the Messiah, came in the flesh, which is definitely a reference to his incarnation. It also does justice to, uh, uh, to an implied uh, pl uh, participle of, of his coming. But it's less than clear why the author insists so strongly that Jesus did not come in water only. Um, the phrase coming through water and blood could refer to his baptism and death. Um, in support of this, we have uh, an author's statement that Jesus did not come in water only, but in water and in blood. This implies that the opponents with whom the author is disagreeing separated the two substances. Um, in response to the author, in response, the author insists on the unity of Jesus and the Son, link between the Holy Spirit and baptism in John 1.33, echoes the same link between water and spirit in 1 John 5.6, suggesting that baptism could be equated with water. Um, and so this might be a possibility that is held, by the way, by Smalley, who is a commentator for the Word Biblical Commentary series, Painter, and Stott. Finally, it could refer to his death, the death of Jesus. Um, this position is held by Raymond Brown and derives the imp its impetus from John 19, 34, which notes that Jesus' death, water, that at Jesus' death, water and blood flowed from his side. This is the only passage in John where the two substances are connected. Uh, Jesus' death is described as a reason for his advent, and the only other mention of blood in, in John's gospel uh, is concerned with the teaching about Jesus' death. One weakness is, uh, this fourth uh, possibility, is the greater uh, likelihood that water is present in the nuance of Jesus' baptism, not his death. Another weakness is that by identifying water and blood with Jesus' death, one makes the author say that Jesus came in or by his death. So uh, in light of these four considerations, um, 
we're going to play some Monday night football. You make the call. Um, I'm going to challenge you that these are uh, positions that are uh, held. I've given you some, um, some references to go to and um, challenge you to go and do some further study after we're done uh, with this class. Um, the one who came by water and blood um, uh, um, it, it needs to be decided by you and we can talk later on or you can um, write a paper and um, draw your own conclusions. Uh, next we want to talk about um, this uh, idea about the three, uh, uh, how the spirit, water, and blood are witnesses that are in agreement. Um, and here, another one, this is, um, all, all that this is saying is that there's total unity uh, between the three. If you take that, uh, a wa uh, that water and blood is a reference to Jesus' death, as Brown does, uh, water and blood, his death and, his, and the spirit are, are in agreement with one another. Um, uh, all, all we're saying is it's, it's total, there's total unity uh, between uh, the three. Um, so uh, uh, that's all that's being said there, that however you determine what water and blood is um, and how you uh, group those uh, water and blood with the spirit, all you're saying is in these verses that there's total agreement. Next, uh, verse 9 uh, of chapter 5 talks about uh, the testimony of men. If we accept the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. Um, here again, um, uh, there's a dis discussion as to who um, uh, uh, receiving the three men in. What, what does that mean? Uh, what does he mean by that? Uh, we see reference to three witnesses mentioned in 6 through 8, um, which we just discussed. Um, spirit, water, and blood are here equaled with the testimony of God. Um, perhaps, um, so perhaps he's referring to um, that, that previous three. Another possibility is that the author is referencing John the Baptist's claim in 132 and 331 to 33. Um, um, understanding of Jesus coming in water. Uh, finally, the phrase of receiving the testimony of three men may be more of a general statement because of the reference to human beings uh, and not a singular reference to John the Baptist. Thus, receiving the testimony of men is a reference to human testimony in general and not necessarily talking about what's happening in three, uh, uh, I mean, excuse me, five, six through eight, but it's just talking about people in general. And that's where I'm at on this. I just think that if we accept the general testimony of men, uh, uh, the testimony of God is greater because this is the testimony that God has testified concerning his son. Um, next, uh, with regards to the power of love and how this fits in, um, verse 10 tells us the one who believes the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Well, this is going back to the, the, uh, the anointing of the Spirit. Uh, God's testimony is in us. Uh, at least that's where I, I'm understanding this. And, and the one who does not believe God has made him a liar. Here again, we're back to looking at um, God being described as a liar. And I believe, um, once again, I mentioned how frequently uh, John uses and references this term liar. And if we look at the appearance of the term liar throughout um, 1 John, um, you can almost see it in a, a chiastic um, layout. Um, in 110 of John, it says, If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar. That's the first reference to um, uh, this term liar being used. And then we come and look at 510, and what do we see? Well, the one who does not believe God has made him a liar. So you've got this first and last uh, description 
or reference of a liar and calling God a liar. Then in verse 2, 4, the one who says, I have known God, yet does not keep his commandments, well, that person's a liar. Uh, in 420, if anyone says, I love God, but hates his fellow Christians, he is a liar. So we have this uh, opening and closing statement. Then we have two statements in the middle that talk about people being liars based upon their inability to love. And the, the kicker, the main one uh, in the middle that is, uh, uh, that is rather uh, significant is, who is the liar but the person who denies what? That Jesus is Messiah. And so if you look at these, these five references, you can almost see it in a chiastic structure. And the, and, the, and the middle of this chiastic structure is the kicker of the book. The opponents, the antichrists, those who are against God, they are the liars because they have denied that Jesus is the Christ. Um, so it's very interesting how um, the, uh, the references to liar uh, play out in this particular book. Um, once again, that can be found in this uh, book on, um, a workbook on um, first and second and third John. Um, next, uh, we want to read verse, verse 11 and 12, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. Um, now we have another testimony being given, and um, the, uh, how does this author picture eternal life? Um, uh, it is life shared by the Father and Son in which the believer must remain. In fact, eternal life is bound up to such an extent with the Son that it can be said to define it. Yet the experience of intimacy with the Father and the Son represented by eternal life in this present age does not exhaust the meaning of eternal life, for it also describes, it's described as a pledge or a promise that awaits its ultimate fulfillment in the future. And we saw that in 1 John 2.25. And the, finally, the character of the Johannine believers demonstrates that they share in eternal life in 5.13. Yet my description of eternal life in 1 John may not be exhaustive. And you can look up some other references in other places. Um, but the idea of eternal life, eternal life becomes somewhat personified and becomes a testimony um, uh, to us. God has... Uh, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in who? The Son. Oh, by the way, Son, Messiah. Another epithet, just another title for Messiah, just another way of saying Messiah, the Christ. The concern that John has here is that people are denying that Jesus is Messiah. Not saying anything about his deity. I often wonder, just as a thought that runs through my mind, John may have written his gospel first, and people became so enamored with him being God, they neglected his humanity. And now he's writing this letter to clear things up. It's, it's not an either or, it's a both and. Um, so, moving right along. The one who has the Son has this eternal life. The one who does not have the Son does uh, Son of God, once again, does not have Messiah, does not have this eternal life. Uh, so here we have um, uh, the, uh, the power to love and, and how it, uh, how it uh, manifests itself in um, uh, God's relationship and working um, through the Son. So we have this demonstration of love. We looked at the essence of love. We looked at the demonstration of love which comes through an understanding of Jesus as Messiah. And um, now we want to look at um, verses, uh, uh, move to the practice of love um, in uh, these next group of verses. I've written these things to you who believe in my name, believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. And this is the confidence we have before him, that 
Whenever we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us in regard to whatever he asks, then we know that we have the requests that we have asked from him. If anyone sees his fellow Christians committing a sin, not resulting in death, he should ask and God will grant life to the person who commits a sin, not resulting in death. There is a sin resulting in death. I, I, I do not say that he should ask about that, uh, about that sin. All unrighteousness is sin, but there is a sin not resulting in death. All right. This is going to be fun. Um, so we have, uh, so John is emphasizing the importance that all these things have been written to those who believe, uh, who believe that Jesus is Messiah. Once again, I'm seeing Son of God. It's not a reference to his deity. It's a reference to his Messiahship. When he refers to Jesus as the Christ, when he refers to Jesus as the Son, when he refers to Jesus as Son of God, they are all, they are synonymous terms to spoke, focus on the fact that he is Messiah who came in the flesh. Um, then he talks about prayer and asking things in his name and asking things as long as, uh, uh, as we are um, uh, obeying his commandments and maintaining this believing faith in Jesus, we ask, he delivers. But then he gets talking about this, um, uh, and we've talked about prayer. It's not like God is our genie in the bottle. It's, it, we got to keep the proper perspective as praying things that relate to kingdom and his program. Jesus said, the disciples ask him, how do we pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We need to be praying kingdom and not narcissistic wants and desires. We'd be praying about what God wants and not necessarily what we want. So let's talk about this sin resulting in death, or at least let's give it a, a hearty uh, uh, try. Um, you know, when uh, I've studied this, I, I find it interesting. Uh, the discussions are all over the map, as you might expect. Um, so what is a sin unto death? Um, the author may be talking about sin that leads to physical and not spiritual death. Uh, perhaps someone might argue. The reason why um, um, homosexual uh, behavior uh, may culminate in AIDS is because they've committed a, a sin that leads to physical death. I don't buy that. Uh, it's, anything is possible. Um, but uh, there are innocent people that, uh, that uh, contract AIDS, and they've done nothing uh, to warrant that. Uh, so, but that is, a, that is a view. A similar view is known from Second Temple texts, uh, where physical death does not seem to be in view in 1 John, making the option very unlikely. Um, it's, it's, uh, although, so even though there is a similar view in Second Temple literature, uh, it doesn't seem to be likely. Um, so perhaps um, the author is distinguishing between serious sins and less than serious sins. Um, uh, in the uh, second century, uh, late second century, um, Christians did in fact distinguish between types of sins. Um, Jesus mentions a sin cannot be forgiven. Uh, the Didache uh, also uh, from about the same time as the Johannine letters, uh, does not distinguish between sins, placing wrong speech alongside murder and adultery. So even though uh, some may distinguish between bad sins and not so serious sins, serious from not so serious, overall there are places in the, in the uh, early church that didn't make those distinctions. A sin is a sin uh, regardless. Um, Perhaps the author is distinguishing sins that can be forgiven from those that cannot. Uh, for instance, uh, deadly sins are those committed deliberately. And we see this in the Old Testament. There are some sins that there were no sacrifices for if it was deliberate. If it was unintentional, then you can, 
then there were sacrifices for unintentional sins uh, to, uh, to take them. But if they were deliberately done, intentionally done, um, uh, there, um, uh, there's, there's no forgiveness, while unintentional sins are forgivable. And so this could distinguish, uh, be coincide with the distinction between intentional and unintentional sins in the Old Testament. Here in John, though, as I think about 1 John and trying to put it within the context of the letter, thinking what it is that John has been talking about, um, it seems the sin leading to death centers on a Christological error of the, um, the opponents. Um, he talks about how they've left. And had they really been of us, they wouldn't have left. But why are they leaving? What was, what was the, what's the driving reason for their leaving? They don't believe what? That Jesus is Messiah. And that he came in the flesh. And so this, this appears to be uh, what this sin is. Um, there is a... Uh, th 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 God will grant life to the person who commits a sin, not resulting in death. So, um, so sins that we normally do, I mean, that, I mean it, whatever, the, whatever we do that are, that's wrong, they are sins that don't lead to death. But the sin that leads to death is the rejection of Jesus as the Christ. And uh, honestly, I don't see too much difference between this and Hebrews uh, 6, where it talks about there's no repentance for someone who rejects the Messiah. And so these are, this, is a, this, is a, this is a strong statement um, being made here. Uh, we, uh, there is a sin resulting in death, and I think that sin in resulting in death is to reject that Jesus is the Christ and that he came in the flesh, that he was human and that he is the Christ. I think that's in keeping with 1 John. Uh, it, it involves the rejection of Jesus as the Christ who came in the flesh. And here's the many places that John reflects a concern. 2, verses 22 to 23. 3, verse 23. 4, verses 2 to 3. And then 15. 5, verse 1. Verse 5. Verse 6. Verse 13, and um, those that seem to favor uh, this are Westcott, Brown, and Painter. Um, so when I think about John and this sin unto death, I think he's talking about those who have turned their back on Jesus as Messiah or rejected this idea that he's Messiah, as opposed to uh, praying for people who may have sinned and need to be um, encouraged in their faith and uh, perhaps make things right with God. We know that everyone fathered by God does not sin, but God protects the one he has fathered, and the evil one cannot touch him. Now, uh, here we are. Um, we are back into another um, difficult um, phrase. Um, now, this is appeared before. Sometimes I've handled it well, sometimes I haven't handled it well. And once again, uh, this is not going to be the end all for your study in the book of 1 John, but let's give it a shot. What does it mean that uh, everyone fathered by God does not sin, but God protects the one he has fathered? And this is particularly important because he's already said those who say they don't sin um, are, are liars. So on the one hand, uh, this is a theological issue. Um, on the one hand, the author sees believers as ideally capable of not sinning. Well, this parallels Paul, at least in Romans 5, where he says, whatever is not done in faith is sin. And then he talks about how we can say no to sin. We have the freedom to say no to sin. We are no longer slave to sin. We, he, as he describes slave as a master, we can say to that master, Master, take a hike, because I have freedom in Jesus, and I am no longer enslaved to you. 
see ya. Perhaps this is the way John is understanding uh, this, uh, this idea, is a believer is ideally capable of not sinning. On the other hand, um, it is possible that uh, the author theology between responsibility and sinless uh, existence uh, and the need to confess is what's going on here. The author distinguishes certain kinds of sin, sin that leads to the rejection of Jesus and the sin encountered in daily life that doesn't relieve, uh, lead to the rejection of Christ. And in light of those connections, the author's previous line of thought, he may have a distinction in mind. Um, and that perhaps what he's saying, those fathered by God does not sin. He does not commit the sin that leads to death. Perhaps that's what he's connect because it's such a close relationship. Um, either way, um, uh, this, John is stressing the need uh, for transformed conduct in the inclusion of this letter. We are to be transformed in the manner in which we live. We should strive not to sin, as difficult as that phrase may be. Um, and when it, when it talks about this idea that, the father, uh, that uh, God protects the one he has fathered, God protects his children, and the evil one cannot touch him, uh, all, you know, uh, this, is, um, this is talking about um, an intention to harm. Now, a lot of times, uh, you know, in, in the Gospels, Jesus touches people and they're healed. Uh, so there's a form of touching that's meant to, to, to heal. Um, less frequently, it's, this idea of touching has a uh, uh, sexual intimacy to it, but it's not very frequent. But in this context, this idea that God protects the one who has fa he has fathered and the evil one cannot touch, it's a reference to the evil one cannot harm him. We are protected. And we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now, this is very interesting, uh, this idea of the whole world uh, it lies in the power of the evil one. The meaning of the phrase here seems to be that the inhabitants of the world are under the control of the one who has prominent place and authority and power in their lives. So if a person does not know God, a person has not accepted the fact that Jesus is the Messiah who came in the flesh, then he belongs not to God, but to the evil one, to Satan, which raises the question, who's your daddy? God? Are you a child of God who has put their faith and trust in Jesus as being Messiah, who came in the flesh, died on the cross, demonstrated what love is, and we follow the commandments of God to love God and love others? Or have we rejected Jesus as Messiah? We are wrapped up in worldly desires, uh, the things of the world, and love people we want to love and hate everybody else? Black and white dualism. You're either a child of God or a child of Satan. And that's basically what John is saying here. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us insight to know him who is true. And we are in him who are true in the Son Jesus, who is the Christ. This one is the true God of eternal life. Um, and I see that this one is being a reference to God as be, and being the true God to life. Now, it is possible that this one could be a reference to Jesus, uh, and, uh, but I've taken it as being God. Uh, but either one, either way, um, um, uh, the point is that we are um, part of, we are in him who is the true, who is true. Um, 
God has come and has given us insight to know Him, that is God, who is true, and we are in God, who is true, through His Son, Jesus. And then he says, little children, guard yourself from idols. And you think, where in the world is that coming from? Once again, it's this dualism. Child of God, child of Satan. Don't worship God, don't honor the Christ, then you're worshiping and honoring something else. And it's an idol. Anything contrary to Jesus and his commands is an idol. So um, that wraps up our uh, study in the, Johann uh, in the um, Johannine letters, the Petrine letters, um, Hebrews, Jude, and James. We've gone through three letters that focused on Jewish believers, and five letters that focused on a mixed audience of Jew and Gentile. James, Jude, and Hebrews, written to Hebrew uh, to Jewish uh, Christians, and first and second Peter are the Petrine letters and Johannine letters written to a mixed audience. All five have one thing in common. Jesus is the man through whom God has accomplished his kingdom program. God set into motion a desire to reestablish his kingdom rule and redeem a people to enter into that kingdom. And that program has been fulfilled in Jesus, our King. I trust that you will walk with our King and that you will be a, a blessing to those that you come in contact with. Have a great day. This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 30, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 through chapter 5, verse 21. Demonstration of Christian love. Mm -hmm.